I am Father Chris Alar of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of Divine Mercy, and thank you for joining us for Living Divine Mercy here on EWTN. You know, of all the religions of the world, what makes Catholicism any different from the rest of them? Well, we're the only faith with the sacraments. We are actually commanded by God in Scripture to receive the sacraments, and First of these is baptism. Baptism impresses the Christian character into the soul, allowing the other sacraments. You know, the baptismal rite is not just a symbol of grace. It is the effective cause of grace. So, Sacraments are not just symbols. They are actual grace. They do something. And baptism confers that first sanctifying grace and the supernatural virtues of faith, hope, and charity. A baptized person now belongs forever to Christ. So it's like branding the soul. You know, as one of the sacraments of Christian initiation, The Christian is born anew. That's because in baptism, original sin, as well as any personal sin that they've committed, is washed away. Now, to baptize means to immerse, but not just in water. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us, The one who is baptized is immersed into the death of Christ and rises with him as a new creature. So, our death in drowning, in a way, is followed by resurrection to life, just like Noah. And that's why Jesus gave the great command, go forth and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is necessary for salvation for all of those whom the gospel has been proclaimed and who have had the possibility of asking for the sacrament because Scripture tells us we must be born of water and the Spirit to enter heaven. Have you ever been asked, and I'm sure you have, if you've ever been saved or if you've been born again? You should answer yes. I have been baptized. You know, often non-Catholics question the Catholic tradition of infant baptism, saying the person needs to be born again, again, having this born-again experience first. So they first accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. That's good. And then they get baptized. But this is not salvific, and it is not a sacrament. That is only a sign of their conversion. So that is why it cannot be given to those under the age of reason, which is age seven for Catholics. But they are leaving their children with original sin, which needs to be removed as soon as possible. Who wants their child, no matter how old, going through life with such a huge stain on their soul? So baptism is the born-again experience. It brings salvation, even if non-Catholics say it doesn't. And we know this from the Bible. Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. 1 Peter 3, 21 states, baptism now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then in John 3, 5, we have Jesus saying, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. You know, this is salvific because, as we said, it takes away original sin and any personal sin along with all the punishment due for our sins. And that is why the grace of Divine Mercy Sunday is like a second baptism, although we don't get baptized twice, because it wipes away all this sin and punishment. This grace allows us now a share in the divine life of God as adopted sons and daughters. Notice that as sons and daughters, we are children. 
and we become full members of Christ's family. Children are full members. You know, many people state that they want their children to grow up and choose for themselves if they want to be baptized. And while it makes sense on the surface, that argument is actually very faulty. When we are born, we don't choose to be, for example, citizens of the United States. We are automatically. And when we are born, we don't choose the family that God put us into. God chooses that from the day one of being an infant and being born. That is why Peter, St. Peter declared, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is to you and to your children. That's from Acts chapter 2. Then there was the uh, Philippian jailer whom Paul and Silas had converted. We are told that the same hour of the night he was baptized with all of his family. That's from Acts 16, all of his family. And then Paul recounted in 1 Corinthians 1.16, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. You know, these passages about the families and the households would most certainly include the children as they are part of the family. You know, Paul also notes in Colossians 2.11 that baptism has replaced circumcision. Now, here's what's interesting. Usually, only infants were circumcised under the old law. Circumcision of adults was very rare, since there were very few converts to Judaism. So, if Paul meant to exclude infants when talking about baptism, he certainly would not have chosen circumcision as a comparison. And that's why even Augustine built on this, saying the custom of Mother Church in baptizing infants is certainly not to be scorned, nor is it to be believed that its tradition is anything except apostolic. You know, and speaking of apostolic, the writing of the apostolic tradition in 2116, that uh, passage from A.D. 215, the year A.D. 215, says, baptize first the children, and if they can speak for themselves, let them do so. Otherwise, let their parents or other relatives speak for them. But many non-Catholic Christians try to ignore the historical writings from the early church. There's no doubt in the early church that the Christians practiced infant baptism, as there were no objections to it until the Reformation of the 16th century. You know, today, many people are not baptizing their children, which is a huge mistake and one that I personally believe is the cause of the world's problems because all problems involve either a lack of faith, hope, or love. And these are the three virtues instilled in the soul at baptism. You don't get them any other way. So please, baptize your children. Now, don't despair if they are not baptized. There is also baptism by desire and even baptism by blood as a last resort. So don't wait, though. Don't wait to risk it. Go for the guaranteed grace of the sacrament now. So to finish, who can baptize? Well, the ordinary ministers of baptism are the bishop, priest, or deacon. However, anyone can technically baptize validly in cases of emergency where death is possible. Also, the person baptizing need not be Catholic or even a baptized Christian themselves. That's surprising. As long as they intend to do what the church believes to be true when they are pouring the water on the head or immersing them while saying the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. These exact words must be used or it is invalid. Now, don't go around giving out baptisms like party favors. Just take the person to your local parish and initiate them into God's family. Remember, only one of the parents has to even agree for it to happen. 
You know, if your child's body needed a bath, you wouldn't hesitate to give them one. So don't deny them when their soul needs a bath as well. Baptism can be one of the most important, if not the most important act you ever do in your life. Don't miss that grace. Now, let's hear an amazing story of a good friend of the Marians, Nermeen Rubin, who through her charity, Water for Mercy, is bringing this gift of life-saving water to many villages in Africa that are in such dire need. So as we mentioned, we're here with a very special guest, Nermeen Rubin, who has started a very important ministry. Now, in future episodes, we're going to be talking about the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. And one of the corporal works of mercy is give drink to the thirsty. Now, Nermeen, we always think of this as being spiritual when we hear this and we think, okay, well, how do I give drink to the thirsty? They're thirsty in spirit. This is all true. But you have taken on the literal challenge of trying, and we'd love to hear how, of solving the entire water crisis in all of Africa. This is an incredible, mm. incredible endeavor, and you did it through the name Water for Mercy. Mm -hmm. uh, first, tell us about yourself, and then tell us how you picked that name. I was born in Egypt, and as a Coptic Catholic, we had, my parents are very, very strong in faith, so we always prayed the rosary there. They actually gave us the foundation of being good Catholic, and then when we immigrated here in the States, of course, uh, and our lifestyle, we became very comfortable, and it kind of um, led me to not really be as uh, religious in my heart. I did the, I, I went through the motions of being a Catholic, but not really a Catholic in my heart. And when God touched my heart to go to Africa uh, and I saw the suffering, I remember, Father Chris, that you always said, love and action is mercy. Yes. When you see your fellow people suffer, and yeah, it's you, just not saying, oh, I feel bad for you and turn the channel. You're right. the one who's responded and said, I'm going to do something about it. Right. And that's why our name is very significant, <laughs> Water for Mercy, because this is really God. And through God, we are now having his love flow like clean water to bring Africa that is very dry green and green with growth, green with hope and green with prosperity so that they could have good food. You have to have water first. And then after you have water, then you have food. So truly, it's all about mercy because the love that I have for my fellow African, as an Egyptian, I am an African. And it hurt me that they don't have that dignity that all of us have. And seeing that the people were walking four hours a day, twice a day, to go get water from a hole, and it was all dark water that is not even fitting for human consumption. Mm -hmm. And it really caused me to do something about it. I, d I thought, what can I do? I'm just one person. Mm -hmm. And God touched my heart so much. And, and there is a saying that people say, God does not call the equipped. He equips the called. And he, when I said yes, when I said yes, that I was going to do this, God equipped me with the best technology ever with our coalition, with our partners, with our boots on the ground who are really digging these solar powered wells and have wow. this amazing technology. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do now. Let's take a look at this video that gives a good summary, Nermeen, of the work of Water for Mercy. The first time I arrived to Africa, I was shocked. Um, when my daughter kept asking to come to Africa, I said, no, I don't do third worlds. Being from Egypt, I know what poverty is. And I didn't want to see that. And thank God we have means. And I always said, ah, let me give to other people. And I don't want to, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. And it was the year I came to Tanzania, which is here now. And we came to Dodoma. And it happened to be in 2017. And I did not know it at the time. It was a drought. There was no water around. I saw women walk for hours and hours and hours getting water and the water was as black as my skirt and they were drinking it without filtering it. I just saw a vicious cycle of poverty with no water. How can they eat? There's no food. 
it hurt my heart so much, then that is the reason why I decided to start Water for Mercy to provide a solution. I know a number of people like the saying, don't give a man a fish, teach them to fish. That is my philosophy. However, you cannot fish if you're hungry. You have to give them water first, give them food first. Then when they're feeling strong, they can think, and then you can teach them to fish. Our whole mission is to provide water, food, and hope. The Water for Mercy team is Innovation Africa for Water, Cultivate for Food, and with Cultivate and Don Bosco, we are providing education. We are now changing these cycles of poverty into bountiful cycles of success. And it touches me when now I go and visit these villagers and I see how they've been able to be so resourceful. And it all starts with one drop of water. They were starting to plant seeds. They were making bricks. They were starting to be motivated. They had water. Now they can have their little gardens and they're growing tomatoes, they're growing okra, and they're feeling good. And that is when I decided to provide a permanent solution, not be on a subsistence level to just survive, but to thrive. That is hope. We are comprised of like-minded organizations that all have heart. We deal with the poorest of the poorest of the poorest. Innovation Africa provides the means to bring water. Step two is food, partnering with Cultivate. The third one, we are providing hope because we're not just growing vegetables and produce through Don Bosco Institute, we are growing professionals. We've got amazing, beautiful Israeli technology and it's being disseminated through the most amazing Catholic school system in the entire world. Through the Don Bosco Network, we are going to be able to establish more ATEC, Agricultural Innovation Technology Centers, throughout Africa so that if we get the seed money within two, three years, easy, Africa is going to be self-sustainable. We need partners to help us, we need donations, and we need foundations to take a look at our solution and realize that our solution is permanent. So wow, what an incredible story of what Nermeen, you developed here and the work that's being done. And again, I keep going back to the fact that God calls us to provide these works of mercy for our neighbor. And you're not doing it just for your next door neighbor, you're doing it for the whole continent of Africa. Now, specifically Kenya and Tanzania is where you're beginning, mm -hmm. but you have a dream that this is going to spread all over the whole continent and, and beyond. Now, the one line that really caught me is when you mentioned in this, and you have the technology and the partners that you're dealing with this is Israeli technology, mm -hmm. is to, in three years, estimate that we might solve all of the water problems of Africa. Now, that's a huge statement, mm -hmm. um, but knowing you in terms of your huge efforts, tell us why you think that's possible and the technology that's involved in this. Well, first of all, this is God working through me as a vessel, so I don't want to say this is all me. This is really God working sure. through me. And the reason why is that w by getting additional support and funds, we know that we can definitely bring this life-saving water to these people. Yeah. And and it is a permanent solution and it is self-sustaining because we are empowering these people. So we're not just giving them a hand out, we're giving them a hand up. You know, let's talk, let's talk now back to, uh, and that's beautiful on the technology, but mm -hmm. tell us maybe some of the heartwarming uh, story, maybe. Give us a story or an example wow. of how you felt when you see the faces of the children or the parents who've not been able to provide clean water to their little children, and now they have this clean water. Are they singing? Are they dancing? Oh. Are, are, it's got to be amazing. Oh. 
amazing. And as you saw in the video, it truly is amazing. And, and what, what I have to share with you, and it's not bragging about myself, it's just more of, it was so heartfelt. It's how fulfilling. Grateful. It's fulfilling. Yeah. And do you know that there is a baby named Nermeen now? <laughs> because at one of our villages, there was a woman. Is she talking yet? Uh, yeah, no, not yet. Thank goodness. Because she'll probably <laughs> talk more than you or me, right? I know. You're the only one who gives me a run for my money. I pray for that baby <laughs> named Nermeen. Oh my goodness. But this woman was pregnant. And when we brought in life-giving water, clean water, this child now was able in her womb to grow healthy. And this baby was born. And when I go, I get to see this little baby who's an <laughs> infant and name Nermeen because they are just so grateful. And what I just always say is, don't thank me, thank God. And the beautiful Amazing. thing I would guess is that if they see that here comes through a person of faith, has now delivered some of the staples. That might bring the faith, many of the people, to the faith oh. themselves. Have you seen a little bit of the faith in, re energized there? In Absolutely. The area? When I go there, my dad, God bless him, he gives me these little prayer cards and little medallions. And when people want to come and kiss me. I know you pass out me, divine mercy cards. Ab absolutely. And I want to say, they'll, they'll kiss me, they'll say thank you. And I go, no, 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 no. Asante Mungu. That is Swahili to say, thank you, God. Mungu is God. Absolutely beautiful. So, the last question that we have for you, Nermeen, is we're do we go from here? Um, we would love to have anybody who would like to support this ministry to be able to help you. So as you can see on your screen, it's waterformercy.org. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody who would be interested in liking to help. So uh, Nermeen, thank you. And to all of you who would like to support this ministry, again, waterformercy.org. Um, it's a great, uh, you're a great friend of our Marian community and Marian helper. Mm -hmm. um, so we invite all of our other Marian helpers to keep them in prayer and all the work that you're doing. So again, thank you, and God bless you. Well, thank you, Nermeen. We are keeping you in prayer and for the great work you are doing to bringing that life-giving water to those in such need. Now, let's hear in the scriptures of exactly the importance of baptism, specifically in Acts of the Apostles. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all that are far off, every one whom the Lord God calls to him. And he testified with many other words and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they held steadfastly to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. Why are the people of Jerusalem eager to be baptized? First, they recall the preaching of St. John the Baptist, who baptized for repentance and preparation for the coming of the Messiah. Now, St. Peter offers baptism in the name of Jesus the Messiah, a baptism that includes the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. Moreover, since water is a natural symbol of cleansing, healing, and life, baptism speaks deeply to all human hearts. In his infinite wisdom, the Lord chooses water to be the sacramental vehicle of the new life in the Spirit that we find only in union with him. Thinking of the ancient symbol of Christianity, the fish, the early Christian author Tertullian says, we are fishes of Christ. We are born in water and only in it do we remain alive. As blessed Father Michael Sapochko writes, what great graces of divine mercy flow into the soul during holy baptism. With the eagerness of the first Christians, we can turn to Christ and ask for a deeper share in his life and a renewal of the graces of our baptism. So not only are the waters that God gives us for cleansing, like in baptism, they're also for healing. Let us hear from Father Joe Roche about the healing waters of Lourdes. I'm standing in Lourdes, just in front of the River Gav, uh, just across from the baths of Our Lady of Lourdes. 
Uh, they're on a lunchtime break right now, but all throughout the day, people can come there and bathe in the miraculous spring, which came when our uh, St. Bernadette had the apparitions of Our Lady of Lourdes. People sit on a bench and uh, line up in uh, preparation for the opening of the baths at nine o'clock. So I was able to pray my morning prayer, pray rosaries, and bring to mind all the people that I was praying for, all the people that I was looking to have a, a healing through the intercession of Our Lady of Lourdes. And then you go in, you, you, uh, in a very dignified fashion, there are many volunteers there that take people into the baths. You're able to go down into the water and go back and uh, be completely immersed. It's like a, a new baptism. It's like a regeneration and a renewal. The Lord wants to pour many graces into us. We all need all different types of healing. And so who knows what kind of healing we need. If we open our heart to whatever God wants to do, he can do many things. Through holy baptism, we entered into union with other souls. Death tightens the bonds of love. I ought always to be of help to others. Thank you, O God, for holy baptism, which engrafted me into your family, a gift great beyond all thought or expression, which transforms my soul. O blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus as a fount of mercy for us, I trust in you. Well, thank you for being with us, and please join us next week as we have a great guest, one of the best college football coaches of all time, Coach Lou Holtz. And we'll be talking about what is the role, if any, of sports in our faith. And until next week, may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.